product placement here. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. Um, this is, uh, it's an interesting moment for me. It's been about 24 years or so since I've been in Scranton. The last time I was here was with John Hines uh, in the year before his death. So it's nice to come back and it's nice to come back and see the community in the, um, in the, in the state that it is in with the, and see the community foundation in um, Laura's hands and see the walk around the campus here. I'm just stunned by the campus. It's, um, it's extraordinary. It's, uh, it, it, it conveys such a great image about what the future of this community can be. So um, when Sandra contacted me, and she actually contacted me through a member of my board, Carol Brown, who is uh, here uh, tonight. And um, Carol, thank you very much for, for being here. Um, I got immediately that Sandra and Carol are cut from the same cloth. So they're very powerful women, and you do not say no. So um, I immediately said yes, I would, I would be delighted to be here. And uh, this is a subject that I love to talk about, uh, the, the subject of, of philanthropy and what it means in our country. Um, I've lied a little bit. I, I said I would do exactly what you asked me to do. Um, and, the, and the truth is I'm going to take more of a narrow angle lens than a, broad, than a wide angle lens. I'm going I'm to give you some numbers. Um, some framework for thinking about how philanthropy works in this country and the importance of it, um, the way that you usually hear about it in the media. But I'm also going to ask you to think about it in terms of the, the, the role it plays in the psychology of our country, in the psychology of the world, and the way we change the world that we live in. And I hope, if I'm successful with this, that you're going to leave tonight thinking a little differently about your own personal philanthropy, what you do with the money you give away, the time you give away, the treasure and talent that you give away, um, and that you'll, you'll think a little differently about the organizations you fund and the foundations that you support, uh, including, one would hope, the university and the Scranton Area Community Foundation. It's another product placement. Um, I'm very blessed because I get to work for uh, a, a woman and a family that believes this about, um, about how you can change circumstances. Teresa said this maybe a decade ago in the context of a community change initiative that we were undertaking at the time. And um, she believed it to the core. The family believes it to the core that we can actually change the circumstances of places that we're in based on the dreams we're willing to have in those places. So that statement actually went up on the website before I left the Heinz Endowments. It's still up on the website. I have no intention of removing it uh, anytime soon. But it's interesting to me that the second half of that quote, the second half of her statement was, um, yes, places become what people dream. The second half was, but in the absence of dreams, they become what people fear. And, and if you listen to the dialogue in our country today, or even down to the state level, or in many communities, the dialogue that we hear mirrors more the second half of that statement than it does the first. In fact, this is the message that we get most of the time from uh, people in leadership positions. Uh, if you listen to members of Congress, if you um, watch the behavior of members of Congress sometimes, if you look at um, leadership at, at multiple levels. And I love, I use this slide in a lot of presentations in a lot of different contexts. But I, I fundamentally believe the narrative that we're telling ourselves right now as a people is that we need to be afraid of lots of different things. So um, ISIS, scary. Ebola, scary. I actually had somebody come up to me at a speech that I gave in Pittsburgh about two weeks ago to tell me that the number one thing philanthropy should be doing is combating ISIS. And I'm not sure how to do that. <laughs> but. But this is, the, this is the, the, the sensitivity of the moment. And, um, and my question that I want to walk through this evening is a little bit how can we maybe begin to change that sense that we're all going to die and instead think about things that are positive which will frame what we are capable of. And that, I believe, is the role of philanthropy. So if you look at the numbers, the numbers are impressive when you take them alone. You know, it's, uh, we have 86,000 foundations in the United States. 
This is unlike any country in the world. We have the largest nonprofit sector in the world in this country. It's a unique aspect of American society driven by the psych psychology of the people and the US tax code. So 100 years of enabling philanthropy has produced these 86,000 uh, foundations. Their giving is 52 billion, um, an enormous amount of money, and they have assets that uh, will soon total a trillion dollars. So an extraordinary amount of money that uh, is being managed by the nation's foundations. Just in Pennsylvania, um, those numbers are smaller, obviously, because we're only a subset of it, but we still see uh, significant foundation presence in Pennsylvania, and we see significant foundation giving in Pennsylvania as well. Uh, Pittsburgh is a unique community in that respect. I'm, I, um, I'm almost embarrassed to talk about the foundation community in Pittsburgh when I go to other communities, because we have more foundation dollars per capita than any other community in the country other than Seattle, and they have Bill Gates, and it's not fair. Um, <laughs> But it's, a, it's an extraordinary legacy of a tradition of giving in the community. And part of what I want to talk about tonight is examples of how that has fundamentally changed the way the community thinks about itself. If you look at total giving in the United States, you know, we tend to think in, in many communities that have foundations, that foundations are the driver of giving. In fact, you and I are, individuals make up the lion's share of giving in the United States. Foundations only account for a relatively small 15%. But, and here I really want to keep this in perspective. Um, I, I did not set out to draw this as a pie chart. I, I rendered it as a pie chart because if I did these three numbers in a bar graph, the foundation number would not materialize. So just as one frame of reference to think about all of the assets that foundations have and all of the money that foundations or even individuals give away, it represents a tiny fraction of what the US government spends every single year. And that's just, obviously, it's the largest share of public spending. But if you include state spending and local municipal spending, it gives you a sense of the scale of philanthropy versus the public sector. One of the conversations that's happening in our country right now is that foundations and philanthropy should take up the slack of government. Yeah. It won't work. And the numbers, I mean, it's simple math if you, if you um, actually begin to calculate the numbers. It's also important to understand who's giving and the dynamics of, are, are there any nonprofit leaders in the room today? I know I met one earlier, okay, great. So you're all seeing this. Um, the dynamics of giving are changing in ways that are mind boggling and difficult to keep pace with. So for the first time, people who study these things, uh, which includes everybody in the room who's, who's running a nonprofit organization, know that for the first time in American history, we have four generations of donors. And I'm going to walk you quickly through who they are. Um, and as with any generalizations about demographics, the generalizations here can be challenged. But these actually work when you think about how people give and what they give to. So the first group is traditionalists. These are folks who were influenced by the experience of the Depression. Um, that, that experience is still in their memory bank by the experience of World War II. That experience is still in their memory bank. And it's produced a set of values that um, adhere very closely around principles of patriotism, selflessness, and so on. Baby boomers. Very different um, set of experiences, and it is the experiences that form us as donors. This is the most important thing for any of us to remember. Um, so the experiences that, that boomers had, we all know what they are. We read about them all the time. Some of us experience them, but Martin Luther King, the moonwalk, um, produced a generation of people who, who believe in mass social movements and who, believe, who are very optimistic, who believe that mass social change is possible. 
the Gen Xers who got a very bad name. Um, and by the way, one of the things you learn in studying the generations, particularly around donors, and I've done a lot of work in convening groups of families to talk about how they can manage transfers of values from one generation to the next. Every generation believes that the ones coming after them are terrible. <laughs> when, you, when, you, when, you, when you have traditionalists and boomers in the room, they refer to the millennials and the Gen Xers as selfish repeatedly um, because actually the values that guide the Gen Xers and the millennials are much more predicated on individual action which appears selfish, but is just a different way of behaving and operating in the world. So these folks um, grew up after uh, a, a, a complete cultural shift occurred in the United States. Many of them grew up as the sons and daughters of divorced parents. They're the sons and daughters of, of single parent households. Um, they are, they, they uh, have seen the failure of social programs in many cases and experience what that's like, so they're very skeptical. They tend not to buy into the very same institutions that the traditionalists value so much. Um, but these folks are tremendously resourceful. They're very motivated still to change the world that they live in and actually some of the highest profile social programs that we celebrate today like Teach for America came from this generation. And then there are the millennials, which quite frankly, none of us in this room understand. <laughs> because um, unless, unless I, I saw some of you in the back, so you, pro you probably do. But this is a generation of people who have grown up not just with a different set of experiences, but with a fundamentally different way of communicating. So they aggregate and, and form community in ways that none of the other three generations have. It affects how they think about social change. They tend to be much more pragmatic, but also much more collaborative about how they approach the challenge of social change. And they tend to focus on personal experience and global issues as opposed to purely local issues. So for the nonprofits in the room, this is way too much text and you can have a copy of the slide if you really want it. The, what, the, the point that I want to make with this slide is simply this. The way in which nonprofits reach out to the next generation, and that includes both the Gen Xers and the Millennials, has to be different from the way in which that they reached out to the previous two generations. So whereas the previous two generations were often comfortable with the model of serving on a board, serving on a committee, or writing a check, this generation wants to do your job if you're the nonprofit head. And they want to get into the business of advising and helping you do your work. So what they need from you and what they need to become engaged in the practice of philanthropy is experiences that they value. If you're not opening if your doors, if you're not connecting them with the opportunity to share in the work, they're not going to feel your organization and they're not going to become devotees of your organization and you will lose support over time. There are a couple of reasons that, that this matters. If, you're, if you care about a nonprofit organization, the, if there's a nonprofit organization that you support or that you run um, and they're not paying attention to this, they will be gone in 10 to 20 years. And you just need to know that. So this, this um, mysterious chart <laughs> refers actually to a study that was done by a major bro brokerage firm about three years ago. And what they did was they looked at what happens to financial advisors managing a family's money after one parent dies. So if there's a child now in the mix and one of the parent dies, parents dies, um, the financial advisor who is managing that money drops to only 45% being retained. So over half are lost when, when one parent dies. When the second parent dies, the percentage actually drops to 2%. So if you're thinking in terms of how do you make the transition from a board of 
people who are traditionalists and baby boomers, and you're not thinking about how to connect with that next generation so that they're first party stakeholders in your organization, you're gonna see a similar drop off in giving donors, board members, future support. 100% to 2% is fairly stark. And that's all predicated on, I didn't have a relationship with the kids. I had a relationship with the parents. So philanthropy, the challenge of philanthropy for nonprofits today is that they have to be able to reach out across these multiple generations. Second reason it matters for nonprofits is that we are in the midst of the largest transfer of wealth in the history of the world in this country. $41 trillion changing hands. And the question for anybody who cares about social causes or an individual nonprofit organization is how do I make sure that my organization or my cause or the thing that I believe in participates in this massive transfer of wealth? The stakes are enormously high. So why the segue to this? <laughs> um, you would think, you would think in the context of what I just described, the dynamics that I just described, that what the nonprofit sector would be talking about and engaging in is a story of possibility and that somehow we would be influencing people to think in terms of immense possibility that, li that lies before us. Instead, this is just another reiteration of the earlier slide I shared. Instead, what we so often hear is stories of dysfunction. We, we hear about scandals in government, scandals in institutions, scandals in nonprofits. Faith in institutions in this country of all kinds, institutions of all kinds, is at the lowest point since it has been recorded. So we all have a, a, something going on in our heads where we think of people in authority, and this is not a political issue, by the way, so please don't misunderstand me. If I do my job well, you won't know what party I belong to at the end of this. It doesn't matter. This is not a political issue. The problem that we're facing in our society is that we don't believe in the institutions that form the society. And we have this, in, this, this notion that we're being run and led by people who are basically broken and dysfunctional. This is the basis for what I consider to be three toxic narratives that are affecting our culture. Um, they're particularly poignant at the moment. This is my assessment of what these toxic narratives are. You will not find this in a book. This is based on the on the work that I've done over the past 20 years and what I've observed. Um, I fundamentally believe that these narratives are inherent to human nature and they manifest in different societies at different times. They are not unique to a political circumstance. They are not unique to the United States. They are not unique to the moment we're in. But they're very, very real right now in terms of governing how we talk about and how we think about ourselves as a culture. This really bizarre Rorschach test is not actually a Rorschach test. So the first, the first um, narrative that I want to just mention is the notion that we are, we are divided as a people and that that's a good thing. So you see it in politics all the time. We see it in the political dialogue where um, increasingly the two parties can't talk to each other, can't find common ground, and don't even want to find common ground. I happened to work for a Senate Republican who believed in fixing problems. So I have been influenced by that throughout my career. I believe in fixing problems. But what we have today is a sense of the need to be uh, a blue state or a red state, a Democrat or a Republican, and it goes well beyond parties. It extends to issues of race. And anybody who has followed what, what's happened in the wake of the Ferguson decision or the, the decision in New York City yesterday not to, not to prosecute the, or not to indict the policeman who, um, who choked a black man on the streets of New York to death recently um, under questionable circumstances. Anybody who has followed that and not seen 
Some of the dialogue that has occurred between whites and blacks is not paying attention to what's happening in our country because we are dividing again. And there's a sense when you read what's happening on social media that that's okay and that's actually good. So this Rorschach test is a study that was done of Twitter, uh, of tweets around the 2012 election. And it was just looking at comments from people in blue areas and comments from people in red, tweets coming from people in red areas. And what the, what the people conducted the study tried to do was determine, okay, let's see how much overlap there is. And what they discovered is there is no overlap. The, the, the folks in blue areas are talking to the folks in blue areas and the folks in, in red neighborhoods and red states are talking to the folks in red um, neighborhoods and states and there is no overlap. So there is a narrative in the country that being divided is good um, and that the route to forward is for us to, to be and remain divided. The second narrative that is all too real at the moment um, and it's it's not American. It's not actually the, the, the notion that lay at the heart of de Tocqueville, de Tocqueville's analysis of what set this country apart. Um, this, this narrative is the narrative that there are some of us who are disposable. And again, I can invoke the, the aftermath of Ferguson and the discussions that you see in social media about how some people regard the racial discussion in this country. You do not have to look far to see that some people believe that there's a class of human beings who are throwaway human beings. Uh, this quote is just one that I picked up because um, I was particularly annoyed by it when uh, the foundation that I was leading, the Pittsburgh Foundation, was helping to lead an effort statewide and we led a coalition of nonprofit organizations and community foundations from around the state to change the name of the Department of Welfare in Pennsylvania to the Department of Human, um, Human Services. Names have power. Welfare does not describe an organization that also supports women who are escaping from abusive relationships, uh, kids who are hungry, and so on down the list. Um, so we wanted to have Pennsylvania join every other state in the United States by changing the name to reflect the services being provided because it turns out that departments of welfare are the easiest thing to cut. But departments of human services are not. And this particular legislator commented by saying, well, you know, some people, um, you know, there should, be, there should be a stigmatism associated with being on welfare. And he was dismissive of all the people in any class of need who, um, who received money of any kind from the government. Almost every one of our social services, by the way, uh, in this country and in this state is delivered through nonprofit organizations. So to, to challenge the idea that um, people receiving money from the government or to suggest that people receiving money from the government are all on welfare would be a, a rude shock to the more than 50% of the population that receives some kind of check from the United States government. The third toxic narrative that I see dominating our, our psyche right now is this notion that we can't do big things anymore. And unfortunately, sometimes it really seems like we can't. So, you know, I, I, I grew up at a time when um, I remember vividly the, the, the moon landing and the sense of immense possibility that went with that uh, in this country. And, and then we had the launch of healthcare.gov Remember the launch of healthcare.gov <laughs> when it seemed like we couldn't even build a website? So the country that managed to land on the moon couldn't even build a website. And the reason that that is so striking as a contrast is that we seem to live in the age of mini-me expectations. So sort of dumbed down, miniaturized expectations. We've stopped believing in the idea that grand change, ambitious change is possible. So what I want to suggest to you this evening is that philanthropy in America is about changing these narratives. It's always been about changing these narratives because these narratives are not new. 
They just happen to be the ones we're dealing with. This is how they're manifesting for us right now. So let me, get, let me offer some examples of how I see that playing out. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw out five ways in which I think philanthropy helps to change that mindset and offers us a route forward as a culture that doesn't have to get us into politics and partisan divisions, that is just about helping our communities. So the first one is that it gives us a sense of community by creating shared experiences and shared, and, and shared identity. There's Talmud um, about, about two men sitting in a boat. I believe this is actually the origin of the story of the, of the, of the phrase that we're all in the same boat. Okay? So there are two men sitting in a boat. Um, they're out on a lake. Uh, one of the men just pulls out a drill and starts drilling beneath his seat. And the other man looks shocked and he says, what are you doing? And the first man says, oh, don't worry, I'm just drilling under my seat. We actually seem to operate as a culture that way, where we think that there is some difference between where you sit and where I sit in terms of the ultimate fate of our economy or of our culture. And yet we're living in a world where never before have we understood so well that what happens to a small child in China affects us here. Or what happens in a, in a dirty coal-fired power plant in China affects your child's asthma. And we're beginning to understand that for the first time. So one of the ways in which we get at that, one of the ways in which philanthropy can help us understand that better is just simply by creating places and spaces and experiences where you and I get that we're connected. And I want to talk um, briefly about something that Carol Brown did, because not just because she's here, but because I would have done this anyway. And it's, uh, I think, a really proud example of, um, of philanthropy at work. This actually started as a vision of, um, of Jack Heinz's, who was Senator Heinz's father. Um, and Carol Brown is the person who translated that into reality. Um, but he had this notion that he could turn a downtown red light district into a center for the arts. And he thought the way to do that was to create art um, spaces in the community, uh, to turn, so he, you know, he, 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 he turned parking lots into plazas. He converted, um, an, a, 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 I guess Heinz Hall was at the time just a, a was it even being used at the time? The movie. movie theater. Um, into, in an area of downtown, by the way, that nobody would go to because it was, it was the red light district and it was falling into, into uh, disuse. This became the home of the Pittsburgh Symphony, um, turned uh, and modernized buildings that had long pa since passed their sell-by date, turned porn shops and porn theaters into um, modern movie and art house movie theaters. So what this did was, was create actually a place where Pittsburgh could come together and experience art. And the art inside those spaces and the cultural district itself that housed them, okay, that seems like a physical transformation, right? If you look at other communities like Pittsburgh's, Rust Belt towns that didn't make this sort of investment, they actually lost their downtowns during the same period of time. Pittsburgh today has the strongest sense of downtown vibrancy of any of its peer cities like Cleveland and, I'll mention Cleveland, they're easy to throw away. But, um, I'll hear about that from somebody from Cleveland. <laughs> this is on tape, I forget about that. Um, but there's, there, there is no question that the reason that Pittsburgh today has the sort of coherence that it does around its vibrant uh, downtown is because people identified with the cultural district. And that started bringing young people into the district who wanted to experience the art there. Um, they started doing gallery crawls to make the space lively. Uh, I now, I've, I've, I've had the weird dynamic of being the oldest person in the room at many of the events that I, that I attend there now. Um, we have, uh, we've seen a resurgence of people wanting to live in the downtown because of the proximity 
to arts events. And what it has done is create a shared sense of identity for people in Pittsburgh and a, pl and a shared sense of, of place. Which leads me into a, another notion about what philanthropy does. It actually gives us the opportunity to demonstrate that transformation is possible. So if there is a narrative in our head that big things aren't possible anymore, or that, that um, when we use the word transformation, we need to dumb down what that means, Philanthropy is actually the place you can go to disprove that. For this, I want to talk about Pittsburgh's um, riverfronts. So there, about uh, the quote that I shared with you from Teresa Hines about places become what people dream actually originated when the community decided that it wanted about 15 years ago to, um, to reinvent its riverfronts. We brought a guy uh, named Alex Krieger, who's an internationally renowned um, design thinker, to come down from Harvard and tell us what he thought of Pittsburgh. And what he thought of Pittsburgh was, and he, he wrote this big report, but this was the best line in the whole report. Pittsburgh is a great place to be a car. <laughs> because because everything in the city, that, that every, every ounce of water or every foot of waterfront property was being used for parking lots, roadways, parking lots and roadways. Um, the notion became that we should try and reclaim that riverfront and do something great with it. And so in a series of packages, not all at once, but with a grand vision of converting that riverfront into a 16-mile loop around the heart of the downtown, we began to turn pieces of it into a uh, park. Uh, actually, one of the first of them that was done was in the Cultural District, thanks again to Carol Brown. Um, we managed to make this the place where we would put a new baseball stadium and, that, and use the, the public dollars available from that to leverage um, the reinvention of the waterfront along what we now fancily call the North Shore. It used to be the North Side, but now it's the North Shore. Um, these are actually both after pictures as opposed to before and after, but, but the, this, this walkway, which runs along the front of Heinz Field, where the Steelers play, and the front of PNC Park, where the Pirates play, and the intervening businesses, um, is one of the favorite places for people to come in when they come to pit, visit Pittsburgh today. This is where they go. This is where they run. This is where they stroll. Um, that wasn't there 15 years ago. In fact, one of the only places that was there was Point State Park, and Point State Park was a place where you were told what not to do, what, not what you could do. So I was struck by this when I first moved to town, that the, this was a place where you went to do nothing. <laughs> Actually, today, with all the technology, we could use that again. But, but, uh, but it was striking, and nobody went. The place was deserted. Um, so a major overhaul was undertaken on, on Point State Park uh, and, and to not only reinstate the original vision, but to connect it to this vision for uh, a downtown riverfront park. This is one of the most striking transformations, but we have a lot of riverfront like this in Pittsburgh. Um, and through, this is all through an organization that we helped create and fund called River Life. They managed to turn that into that. And Pittsburgh's signature fountain, which had not only fallen into disrepair, um, but it actually stopped functioning, um, was restored to a level that um, is really quite extraordinary when you see it today. I wanted to, to use this image in the context of this transformational idea because one of the conversations that I heard often from people, and I heard it from people who actually have views on a place called Mount Washington overlooking the park saying, you know, we can't afford that anything good like that. I said, well, what should we have? And they said, well, we should just, you know, maybe turn it back on. Um, but, but people honestly couldn't understand why we would spend money on trying to create a great public space. And you hear this debate all the time, 
when communities debate having new libraries or new cultural facilities or new any public anything. And the reality is it changes people's lives when they begin to see that something great is possible. So the 16 year vision, 15 years, I mean the 16 mile loop that I've talked about, um, 15 years into it we're halfway there. And we actually see a path to get to the rest of it. But we believe what we're doing is turning that space where nobody came because you weren't allowed to do anything into a place that is literally active 24 hours a day. Philanthropy also gives us proof that we need each other. I'm going to speed through a couple of these examples because I know I'm running out of time. Um, we actually ran while I was at the Pittsburgh Foundation uh, at the start of the recession a program called Neighbor Aid and it was simply designed to help people in our community understand that the people being hurt by the recession were not some nameless, faceless people in some other town. It was actually their neighbors. And it manifested in ways that they would never think of. It wasn't that they were necessarily being thrown out of their homes, but that they couldn't pay their utility bills, or they couldn't buy enough food, or they couldn't buy enough um, clothing, or they couldn't get to work, which is actually a phenomenally common problem. Um, this program was tremendously successful in helping reframe the conversation in our community so that it wasn't about giving to social programs, it was about helping neighbors. And it turns out that philanthropy, when we talk about helping neighbors, is much more successful. If I know the name of somebody I am helping, studies have proven I am much more likely to give to that than I am to any number of statistics you will throw at me. Give me one person I know and I will give to that cause. Give me a bunch of statistics and I won't. So reframing the conversation around neighbors is important. We've followed the same model in a major scholarship program that we've launched in Pittsburgh called the Pittsburgh Promise, where we're um, promising to put uh, every kid who graduates from the Pittsburgh public schools through college. And they, they're all guaranteed up to a $40,000 scholarship um, if they stay in school and get good grades during the time that they're there. And um, in the time that since we've started it, we're beginning to see, for all these numbers, here's what I want to convey. Um, we're beginning to see kids graduate from high school at higher rates, and we're beginning to see kids graduate from college at higher rates. Why is that? The answer has to do with believe, having somebody believe in them. And the way that we have actually sold this program is by telling the stories of individual kids. And the stories are phenomenal. One, one young man, when this program was announced, knew that he needed a 2.0 grade average at that point to get the scholarship. And it was mathematically possible for him if in his senior year he went from getting all Ds to getting all A's. That young man went to the executive director of this new program and said, is it mathematically possible for me to do this? And the, pro and the program director said, well, yeah, <laughs> if, you, if you get all A's. That young man got all A's, went on to study petroleum engineering, and is now working in the Marcellus shale fields for a company that is um, engaged in, in Pennsylvania. Um, that young man was one of the young men that you would think of as a throwaway child if you were willing to believe that there are throwaway children. He is one of seven kids, didn't know who his father was, um, thought that the only way to make money in his neighborhood was to be a drug dealer. And today he's one of uh, an amazing group of productive young people in society who are coming out of this program. That leads into the fourth piece of this, which is that philanthropy is something we can use to prove to each other that we can actually help each other. Uh, this is kind of a broken notion at the moment. We, we wonder if that's really possible. Uh, and I'm just going to breeze through these. I, I actually, family support centers are, are a mechanism for helping uh, families, disadvantaged families who may lack resources to, to come to one place and get the support and help that they need. The movement to create family support centers started in Pennsylvania and the model was created here. 
uh, through the, the support that was provided by, um, by philanthropy such as the Heinz Endowments. Um, and actually, probably a better example and a more compelling example because I think it's something we all intuitively get. If you want to ensure the future of any young person in America, the place to start is at birth or actually before birth. We now know that the way young brains are shaped, uh, the best thing you can do, the best investment you can make is in teaching kids to read and write, giving them exposure to early vocabulary, to, to an extensive parental vocabulary, even before they go to kindergarten. And yet, Pennsylvania, um, for much of the 80s and 90s, was one of the worst states in the United States in terms of support for early care and education. So philanthropy started a public-private initiative, a partnership, to try and change that. And they did research, and they underwrote programs, and they supported initiatives, and they started talking to legislators. They started talking to gubernatorial candidates. Not, by the way, we're not, the private foundations, unlike community foundations, Laura, are not allowed to lobby, but they are allowed to talk to legislators about what we know about what works and what doesn't. And um, launched a campaign in 2002 called What About the Kids? Uh, and as a result of this, Pennsylvania has actually now become a model state in terms of the provision of early childhood education and services. Um, we're a place that, that, that people in the country come. And what we've demonstrated is a tremendous shift in outcomes for young children. We've demonstrated that we can change lives. And that actually is where I want to end because it's, this is the fifth point and to me the most compelling. Um, philanthropy is, to me, probably the most practical tool we have available to us as individuals and as a society to turn collective dreams into a reality. Um, this, is the, this is the mechanism that still works in terms of convincing ourselves and each other that we can dream big and not accept the dumbing down of our ambitions and our expectations. Um, did anybody see the yellow duck when it was in Pittsburgh? This is actually, yeah, Carol, of course. <laughs> um, you know, I, I, I love the rubber ducky. Um, and I, but the reason I want to end with this, with this photo is, and, and this idea of big transformation. Um, Culture is the hardest thing to change. You know, the, the, in, in an organization or a society, culture is the hardest thing to change. So in Pittsburgh, I learned when I got there and began working on issues related to the rivers, um, people grew up being told one thing about the rivers. Do not go near the rivers. So one of the reasons that people didn't go to Point State Park was that there were signs telling them what not to do, and it was kind of an unpleasant experience, but people in Pittsburgh do not go near the rivers. Um, that was the culture of a, of a town that was once hell with the lid off and where the rivers were used for barge traffic and industry. It was a very logical thing, but it ingrained this notion in the culture that you shouldn't go near the rivers. 20 years of philanthropy around reconnecting people with the rivers that had to do with putting trails down long before river life began its work, um, creating programming on the rivers so that people would see a reason to come and visit the rivers, began to change the psychology and the culture. When this um, rubber ducky uh, came to Pittsburgh um, last year, it was last year, right? Um, there was actually a day when it arrived that drove um, people who were of, uh, you know, this is, this is a work of art. And there are some people who believe that is not a work of art, that's a yellow duck. Um, but that day, I want you to look at the people on the riverfront. It fundamentally, the, the, the work that philanthropy did changed how people view themselves in relationship to the water resource that defines the city. This is the city of three rivers, where you don't go near the rivers. 
and now it's the city where you embrace the rivers and we see it as a part of, of everyday life and philanthropy did that. So what I just invite you to think about um, is this. We're all in the same boat for real. There are not enough gated communities in the world for us to hide behind. Um, we actually don't get to divide from each other. What happens in China or India happens here. What happens in a place that we may dismiss as a ghetto or an unsavory neighborhood will come to your neighborhood as well. We are all connected. Philanthropy gives us a way not to be scared by that but actually to embrace that as an immense possibility for change and to believe in ourselves. That, to me, is what philanthropy in America is about, not the numbers. Thank you. Laura. My first question is, in terms of the narrative that you've laid out, do you believe that the narratives ex exist equally or that in a post-industrial city sometimes they're more fierce? And do you also think that, you know, in terms of your experience in leading the community foundation as well as the private foundation, what do you think are some of the most important roles that a community foundation yeah. should you repeat the question? Yeah, so the, so the, the questions were, um, do I think the narratives are, are, as my sense of them, influenced by being in a post-industrial city? And what are the differences, or what are the roles that a community foundation can play? Um, I've studied a, a lot of different communities, and I've spoken and met with folks in a lot of different communities. These narratives are everywhere. They manifest differently. They're in every country. They manifest differently. But you know, con the, you go to LA, and LA, you know, Pittsburgh's so, so different from LA. It's mind-boggling. You know, LA has this. Has, its motto is um, "America only sooner," and they've got 170 different ethnicities in the city. And Pittsburgh, um, because of the collapse of the steel industry, stopped experiencing immigration in the 1960s and missed out on all the waves of immigrants who came in after the 1960s. So we're the most black-white community in the United States, where that's the, that's the, the primary um, ethnic divide. And, um, and yet, every community is still dealing with these narratives of what's possible, how are, are we connected or are we, are we different, um, having to figure out ways in which to bridge differences. So I actually see the narratives as maybe manifesting differently, but still as the, 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 the toxic narratives are there, but the solution set is still the same. The solution set is figuring out how to use philanthropy in these five different ways so that people understand that we are in one boat and that we are connected and that we can do something about it and that there, good things are possible when we listen to the angels of our better nature and so on. Um, the role of community foundations, just very quickly, is um, I, I, I wouldn't have left the community foundation world if it hadn't been the Heinz Endowments that called me. Um, the, the Pittsburgh Foundation is, uh, what, it was my experience of it, but it's just so much fun. <laughs> um, you, you have to raise money. That's part of the job. But what you're creating is a resource for the community. And I, I fundamentally believe this about community foundations. The value they bring and the way they raise money successfully is not by behaving as a bank. It's by providing leadership to the community. That means that they have to do research, they have to convene conversations, they have to take stands occasionally, they have to show that they care because donors fundamentally don't want to invest in a bank, they want to invest in something that they care about. You will lose donors if you do that, and I lost a few. I also had four record years while I was there um, in, in a down market. And I believe that it was all about displaying leadership to the, uh, to the community and giving people a reason to care. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. We are 
there are very similar than Pittsburgh. I actually grew up in Pittsburgh and I saw this stuff. So I know exactly what you've gone through and yeah. the great work that the Pittsburgh Foundation does. Um, there are two major industries left here in northeastern Pennsylvania education and healthcare. I think Pittsburgh is virtually identical to that. How do you find their role, their participation in this whole process? given that they are the major employers, the major, you know, um, Well, it's, you know, it's, a, it's complicated. I, you know, they're, they're hugely important to the economy. Uh, they're powerful engines of change. Um, and I think actually what I've seen over the course of the time that I've been in Pittsburgh is that there's been an evolution on the part of the, of the large research universities to see themselves as community anchors and not just um, separate institutions. So the University of Pittsburgh and Carnegie Mellon University um, collaborate. They both have new leaders. Their new leaders have expressed a desire to collaborate in some pretty exciting ways. They're committed to the neighborhoods that surround them, which is important. They're um, working with local companies. They're becoming a place that um, cares about spinning off companies. And we're uh, in Pittsburgh seeing our universities become a place where Go you know, Google is now developing its largest office outside of California um, in Pittsburgh uh, as a result of the proximity to Carnegie Mellon University. Um, so those, they're, they're hugely important. Healthcare, um, are in, 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 in Pittsburgh, that's a complicated story because there's, there's this huge fight going on between our medical system and our single largest insurance system. They're both exceedingly important to the health of the community. Uh, so those of us who care primarily about the community and about the quality of healthcare are, are angst-ridden, <laughs> to say the least. Um, their, their importance to the economy is just, it's very clear and they're becoming even more important um, over, over time. Um, we have some other factors in, in Pittsburgh because we're also still, because of PNC Bank, a finance center. Uh, and we have strength around that and we have strength around technology uh, that uh, continues to grow. Um, but those are, the two you mentioned are really the ones that helped us, that and finance helped us ride through the, uh, through the recession. Yes. A few months ago I read an article written by Lewis Coleman, a name you may recognize, who was given over $500 million uh, to charity. And he, his article was harshly critical of private foundations and donor advised programs which he said they depart your funds and they re can remain inert for yeah. too long a period of time. Sure. So let me separate the two. Um, a donor advised fund is a subset of, a, of usually a community foundation at best. Uh, you know, when they're, when they're at their best, they're at a community foundation. Um, the reason I say that is you can actually create a, a donor advised fund through a financial institution. Um, they're not going to work with you on doing philanthropy well. A community foundation will. So. I want to make as many plugs for, for Laura as I possibly can. Um, but um, so, so the, the way rules, the tax rules work for a donor advice fund, you can actually put money in a donor advice fund and um, not give out money from that at a specific rate. Um, so you can decide not to give in a particular year, or you can give 3% in a year and maybe 7% in another. Um, for private foundations, the requirement is that you must give 5% out every year. Now, here's the, here's the magic of not trying to dictate everything that people do. Donor advice funds actually give more money uh, in terms of a percentage than private foundations do. Why is that? Well, it's because people actually tend to be more generous out of their donor advice funds and they tend to give it about 7 or 8%. Um, which, is, which is extraordinary. When you set a minimum of 5%, guess what people give? 5%. So, but there's actually also a great reason for that. And there's a, um, I'm, a, I'm a huge defender of the 5% rule for private foundations, and here's why. 
the choice in our culture it, as it's being framed by um, particularly newer entrants into philanthropy who come out of the tech sector, they will tell you that um, they're the best judges of how their money gets used, and that's probably true. If they made the money, they, are, they, they, they have every right to give it away. Um, but the, there are other people in society who are saying, look, society is better served if you get that money out the door right away. So it's the time value of money argument, and if you put the money out the door right now, as opposed to letting it sit around, it will do more social good. I, I remember talking years and years ago with a guy named Carter Brown, who was the director of the National Gallery of Art, about this very subject before he died. And he said, people forget the value of perpetuity. And Pittsburgh experienced the value of perpetuity. So when I say that there is a downtown Pittsburgh today because of the cultural which Carol headed, uh, there's a downtown Pittsburgh today because there were legacy foundations that were set up for perpetuity who were there when they were needed. And here's what we forget about wealth cycles. We tend to think that they're the same over time. Uh, we're, we're, we happen to be going through a period where there's enormous wealth being created in the country through the technology revolution, and that's great. We maybe shouldn't count on that always being there forever. So there used to be a value in this country of setting some money aside for the future, and I view philanthropy and foundations as the money we set aside for future generations. You know, would I love to be the president who got to give away $1.6 billion all at once? Of course. I, I think I'd be fired pretty quickly, but, but, but I don't think that that would actually be serving the mission of a foundation that was set up to be around in perpetuity. And the reason it was set up to be around in perpetuity was because we don't know what the future needs of society will be, but we want there to be some resources available for people in the future. And I think it's magical, actually, to do that, to, to be willing to part with, with um, money over time in that way, I think, is, is powerful. Yes? I um, am the executive director of a nonprofit organization. And as part of our strategic plan, uh, one of the focus areas is leadership. And our board of directors is focusing on the succession management of, of our board of directors and how long some of our board has been with us and looking to this, the newer generation. My experience, our experience, is, is very different from what you mentioned about the, the younger folks will want to do our job. Uh, our experience, as we have had actual conversations and, and, and recruiting and searching and talking and and also research, is that there is um, an impatience about, and that, for instance, board meetings are just, they don't get them at all. That's, that's <laughs> correct. And, and so the level of... They spell them differently, too. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, well, it's, um, it's such a great framing of that. So um, one, of the, one of the lessons I've learned in dealing with this issue is um, both generations need to be respectful of each other. And it often, fall, if, it often falls to the older generation to be respectful because the younger generation doesn't want to be respectful. It wants to do things. Um, and and, and it's incumbent upon the older generation to recognize, okay, we have wisdom, but they have insight. And, uh, and so how do you marry those two in a different way? And what I mean when I say that they want to do your job is not necessarily that they want to sit as executive director of the organization and go to the board meetings. 
They want to solve the problem. And they may have completely different ideas about how to do that. Uh, and, the, and the challenge for you and your board is to figure out what of that has value and how you might incorporate it into your business model and your way of doing things. The other thing that I think is important is, um, it, is it is essential not to lecture. You, know, the, the, you, you, you will get nowhere by lecturing millennials on what they need to understand because they think we're stupid anyway. Oh, and, <laughs> And, and, and we don't know what they know about technology, and we don't know what they know about, about how they communicate amongst each other. So, um, so instead, though, what we can do is open doors on experiencing what the problem is and, and what the challenges of delivering the service are. So what I found is very successful in the nonprofits that we've worked with has, have found is very successful is um, letting them actually experience what it's like to deliver the service or deal with somebody who's facing the challenge. Um, that, that authentic connection, you know, the word authenticity comes up in this a lot. Because the place where we meet is um, you're doing this work because you want to change the world and you're out to do something real for real people, right? I mean, that's, that's who you are, I would bet, if you're in the role that you're in. Okay. And, and I mean, that's typically true. That's the typical nonprofit profile. Um, the, the young people coming into the room want to do that too, uh, but, but, they, but they, they want to do it in a, a way that's authentic for them. The board meetings don't feel authentic. So they need an authentic experience that, that, that connects them to what you're trying to do. And I, I think that's the only way to, to find middle ground. Uh, it's much smaller. Um, it is, you know, in, in, in many countries that we have framed in our thinking as socialist, um, the government prov often provides the service that private philanthropy does here, and so private philanthropy has been pushed aside um, or, or has never taken root. It's never formed. Um, but you're actually beginning to see, I was just over there because I'm, uh, I, I'm studying the Nordic countries now to see how we can apply some of their better thinking to what we do in Pittsburgh, uh, particularly around sustainability and energy use. Um, but they are now, we're now beginning to see foundations form there that are focused on social issues because they're experiencing dramatic challenges with immigration. Um, the, the, the nature of the relationship between the state and the individual is changing, even in those countries. And so we're beginning to see foundations form in those places. But there, it's, you know, if you want to study where philanthropy is being done well, you, the, the United States is where you come. November day, it was a still move. I went to the Pitt Penn State game, and um, I really, I have not, it's been 43 years. Uh, uh. It's been 12 weeks, most memorable 12 weeks of my life. <laughs> <laughs> but it has obviously changed. Yeah. 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 Well, great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Please join us uh, in the lobby for some drinks.